No to Chip Goodyear, the state-run sovereign uh, wealth investment fund, abandoning appointing him as CEO because of what it calls differences as it relates to strategic issues. What led to it all? Earlier, I talked to David Cohen of Action Economics in Singapore if it was because of a clash of personalities. I suspect it was just some, some they had some policy differences and, and he, he was unprepared to take take whatever coaching that they were intent on giving him and, and uh, you know at the end of the day it, it shouldn't make much difference it, uh, they're still going to uh, continue smooth operation they, they, they have a, a an experienced staff in place and they're still facing the same issues that any uh, manager of a hundred billion dollar portfolio faces in the these interesting times you know the uh, they the, they they've, uh, they've taken a bath at Tomasic in a lot of things like some of their bank investments B B of A Bank of America Barclays uh, chip comes with a rich rich experience in materials management and and commodities uh, you know is it Tomasic's loss do you think it's is it Singapore's uh, loss uh, not having a candidate of this stature with that kind of a pedigree yeah it's probably a loss for both of them i mean you know jobs like this managing a, a hundred billion dollar war chest don't come along every day and and as you say he had considerable experience they, they took their 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 own lumps last year uh... during the financial crisis but again that that wasn't really out of line with with, with most uh, portfolio managers i mean i mean even warren buffett took his lumps last year but uh... uh Yes, it, it did seem that, that he, he brought some, some uh, useful experience to the table that, that, that would have been benefited uh, Tomasek. That's why I say they, they probably both lost you know, for this. And, and you know, it, maybe you just chalk it up to some good theater here. And that was David Cohen, Action Economics, with his uh, view on uh, Tomasek's situation. Let's uh, throw it to Jeff here from JPM. AM. Any thoughts to add to the, uh, you know, they're not going to tell us everything about uh, what those strategic differences were. How It, uh, it would be very unusual for Temasek to <laughs> tell you everything, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't like to comment on it, really, except that, uh, you know, I think a lot of um, investors are maybe reviewing their fund managers. Yeah. You know, well, it's, remember, remember a while back we talked about the heft of the, uh, of the sovereign, of the SWFs, the uh, sovereign mm -hmm. wealth fund. So China, when did they establish yours? Last year, year before? It's a pretty, it's a pretty young, it's, it's a new baby. It's been about two years now. Yeah, it's a pretty it? new yeah. baby. It kind of yeah. kicked off with a $200 billion check cut from the uh, federal uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, from the uh, federal government there um, nobody seems to be talking about the sovereign wealth funds anymore have they been overtaken by retail liquidity about uh, you know about flows and uh, ebbs and tides of, of cash from elsewhere we haven't even used that term uh, swap SWF in a long time well I think there was some concern with sovereign wealth funds throw their weight about but really they're just one player and I think when markets are changing there are huge flows uh, going in and out of the regions. I think the sovereign wealth funds, are, they're not dominant by any means. And they tend to be more long-term investors. I think the IMF looked at them. I think there was uh, some set of rules that were suggested that they should play by. And now the issue seems to have, as you say, it's no longer in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let, let, let's get back to the, uh, to, to the crux of our issue today. Uh, you are positive on many things in terms of what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, stimulus policy, a lot of the initiatives. Uh, what, what are some of the negatives? What, what, what are the biggest uh, sort of swing factors that still kind of linger in your mind as a, as, as a dark shadow mm -hmm. over the whole, over your whole, uh, you know, uh, over the entire vocabulary that we work with? Right, well, I think uh, we are uh, believing that the uh, medium-term outlook is going to be pretty challenging. It could well be a W-shaped recovery, in other words, an inventory rebound mm -hmm. uh, in the second half of this year, going into 2010, and then maybe growth fading thereafter. Mm. So um, it could be uh, several years of really weak growth, subtrend growth in the U.S. and Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have a lot of worries about the European banking system, which seems to have lagged the U.S. in terms of recapitalizing, in terms of getting its problems out into the open. Mm -hmm. And we think maybe markets short term have got ahead of themselves, because a lot of these green shoots have been related to soft data, to business and consumer confidence surveys, not really to the hard data. So you, you, you subscribe to the theory that this might be a head fake then, what we're seeing now? Uh, I mean, the Hang Seng's at, what, 12, 20,000 or, or, there, or thereabouts. Last time I checked, it's rebounded mm. like 70% since the end of March. It's nuts, isn't it, in some ways? 
It's, I mean, we'll take it, but it's not. <laughs> we'll take it, yes. That, that's one of the risks for Asia, is that there could be an asset bubble, because so many people now believe in the China story, the, the India growth story, um, and there's so much money coming into what is still a relatively small market. So mm -hmm. I think that that is a risk that we could see um, stock markets bid up and then a bit of a hangover afterwards. But then uh, it's warranted in the sense that Asia's fundamentals are relatively far superior to those of the US or Europe. So we're quite happy with that. Yeah. So but the it, problem is too many hmm. people are latching on to the same set of uh, principles there, this, or the same story. I mean, when you get Americans, you know, in any town or middle town USA saying, I, I like the China story. I don't like what's going on at my Western Community Bank. Then you got, well, you got money. <laughs> All chasing after the same mm -hmm. small pot or the small, you know, the, basically the same prize. That's why uh, emerging markets are never really defensive investments. You do get this uh, hot money which tends to flood in and then you get what the IMF calls a sudden stop and it all flows out. Mm -hmm. But uh, this time I think we are seeing a better uh, chance of incremental decoupling both in economics and in market terms. Mm -hmm. I mean the market decoupling between Miski Asia and the S&P mm -hmm. since October is simply phenomenal. Okay, we're going to take that. We're going to talk about the overweights, the relative overweights uh, later on in the program. Uh, on the, uh, with Jeff, but uh, overweight OW on China, OW on India, uh, relatively sanguine on a relative peer-to-peer uh, -peer basis in uh, other markets. We'll talk this through. A lot of you writing in. We're going to take all this up in the next section of the show as AC continues.